<clears throat> okay, so the, the purpose statement of John that we go over every week, uh, John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And, and I think you'll see that the seed of that is buried in our lesson today. Um, and it's actually buried all through the, the, the gospel, but it's going to come up again in this one, this lesson. Now, <clears throat> One of the unique things about the Bible is that it tells us over and over and over how God works and interacts with us. Right from the beginning of the Bible, uh, in the Garden of Eden, it is presented as the ideal meeting place between God and man. God and Adam walked in the cool of the day, like friends. And while sin interfered with that relationship, we can see elements of that meeting place, that ideal meeting place, in the altars in Genesis, and then the, also in the tabernacle, and later in the temples. And then we see it ultimately in Jesus and the church. And, and we anticipate that perfected meeting place ultimately in heaven someday. And also in the Bible, early on, we find sin requires sacrifice. Animals are killed to cover the sin and the shame of Adam and Eve. Blood sacrifice of Abel is accepted and Cain's was rejected. Then the sacrificial system is introduced. The Levitical law and ultimately Jesus on the cross. And all of that blood was shed to cover and atone for the sins of man. And we can go back all the way to the beginning of the Bible and we can look at covenants. Noah and Abraham, then Moses and Christ. These covenants show how God works out the rules and the parameters and the boundaries of how our relationships should work with him. Over and over, God's word establishes these types and these shadows of things to come. And I think there's two main reasons for this. Uh, one is to show that God is sovereign and active and working out his plan of redeeming man from the beginning all the way to the end. God's fingerprints are all over the plan. But also so that we can look at how God has done things in the past and know this is how God works. This is typical behavior for him in redeeming man. So when we read through our Bible, we should not be surprised by garden temple language. Uh, we should not be surprised by blood sacrifice and atonement, Passover lambs and priests uh, entering into the holy place. And we should not be surprised by covenant relationships. We should not be surprised by kings that are betrayed because it's happened before. Last week in the end of Cody's class, he read uh, chapter 13, verse 18, and it says, I, Jesus said, I am not speaking to all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. <clears throat> so something happened in the past that is very similar to what's going on in Jesus' life. In Psalm 41, Cody quoted it last week, uh, Psalm 41 is a lament by a king in distress. David, King David. He is recalling the painful experience of being mocked by enemies when he is already suffering from a debilitating and life-threatening illness. But despite all of the things that were going on, the cruelest cut of all was the betrayal of a friend. Now, the episode in King David's life that most commentators believe he is talking about is when his son Absalom attempted to take the kingdom from him. In 2 Samuel chapter 15, 
verses 10 through 14, they read as such. But Absalom sent secret messengers throughout all of the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then say, Absalom is king in Hebron. With Absalom went 200 men from Jerusalem who were invited guests, and they went in their own innocence and knew nothing. And while Absalom was offering the sacrifices, he sent for Ahithophel, the Gileonite, David's counselor from, from Gil Gilhol. And the conspiracy grew strong, and the people with Absalom kept increasing. And a messenger came to David, saying, The heart of the men of Israel have gone after Absalom. Then David said to all of his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise, let us flee, or else there will be no escape for us from Absalom. Go quickly, lest he overtake us quickly and bring down ruin on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. <clears throat> While Absalom is the major threat behind this rebellion, Ahithophel is the major player in the story. He, he has been the longtime counselor of David. He was known for being wise. He was known for giving sage advice. In 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 23, it says, Now in those days the counsel of the Ahithophel gave was as if one consulted the word of God. So was all of the counsel of Ahithophel esteemed, both by David and by Absalom. So this guy was known for being wise. He was known for giving good counsel, and he had been by David's side for years. Now, on top of that, there is evidence that he was also family to David. If you remember the, the infamous sin uh, of David when he brought Bathsheba into his home, one of David's attendants tried to passively remind the king, without overstepping his role, that the king was in dangerous territory. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 3, this attendant said, and, and David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Like, hint, hint, David, you know these two guys. Are you sure you want to do this? <clears throat> He's reminding the king. He's name-dropping Elam and Uriah because these two men were part of da uh, the warrior group that was referred to as David's mighty men. These guys were faithful, elite soldiers. Later in 2 Samuel, when they were listing those men's deeds off, in 2 Samuel chapter 23, it says that Elam is the son of of Ahithophel, the Gileonite. So David married Bathsheba. He brought her into his home, and he brought her wise grandfather in as his personal counselor. And Ahithophel served him for years, faithfully next to the throne. But when this rebellion started, and Absalom is David's son is rebelling, rebelling against the king, Ahithophel's changed sides. And his intimate knowledge of past sins against his granddaughter and, and his son and, and knowledge of how King David functioned made him a particularly dangerous traitor. And how close he was to David for so long made it particularly painful. So when we read through Psalm 41 and we hear the king's voice in a time of great distress, David praises God for protecting him from the enemies and, he, and how thanks God for sustaining him from the sickness. And he asks for God's grace for when he sins. And he lists all the things that the enemies are doing to him. But in verse 9, and the one that Jesus quotes of Judas, it is the betrayal of the friend that stings the most. Even my close friends in whom I trusted, who ate my bread 
has lifted up his heel against me. Now, I share this Old Testament history with you this morning so that you can see that there is a pattern of betrayal established in the Old Testament that is being fulfilled with Jesus and Judas. So in our text, John focuses on Judas Iscariot. And he, like Ahithophel, betrays the king. And we might not, must not forget that there is another character lurking in the background of this gospel account. Who am I thinking about? Who is Judas in cahoots with? The devil. Just like Absalom, the devil is trying to take the kingdom away from Jesus. That's all the devil ever wanted. He wants to be king. He wants to be God. He wants to usurp the authority of God himself. And we see this early on in Jesus' ministry when the devil tempted him uh, in the wilderness. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 through 10, uh, uh, just verse 8, I think, 8 and 9. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all of the kingdoms of the, the world and their glory. And he said to him, all of these I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Satan was offering Jesus an out. No suffering, no battle, no spiritual warfare, no shots have to be fired. But Jesus rejected that offer. So through the Gospel of John, we have seen a resistance grow against Jesus. We've seen arrest warrants go out. We've seen threats of stoning. We have seen a conspiracy forming from the highest officials in the land of Jerusalem, or in Judea. And that is all Satan trying to become king. And Judas is an essential part of the trap, the prophetic part. A, a, a friend with intimate knowledge of the king. And he knew how the king functioned. He knew where the king would be. And he was going to sell him out for 30 pieces of silver. <clears throat> now back in the Old Testament, that rebellion against David ultimately failed. Ahithophel went home, and he hanged himself, just like Judas. In 2 Samuel chapter 17, verse 23, when Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his donkey, and he went off home to his own city. And he set his house in order, and he hanged himself, and he died, and he was buried in the tomb of his father's. And then Absalom, he fled from the overwhelming force of King David's army. In 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 6 through 10, it says, So the army went out into the field against Israel, and the battle was fought in the forest of Ephraim. And the men of Israel were defeated there by the servants of David. And the loss there was great on the day, 20,000 men. And the battle spread over the face of all the country, and the forest devoured more people that day than the sword. And Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak, and his head caught fast in the oak, and he was suspended between heaven and earth, while the mule that was under him went on. And a certain man saw it, and he told Joab, Behold, I saw Absalom hanging in an oak. <clears throat> Ironically, Absalom met his end because of a tree he didn't see coming. And that same thing can be said of Satan and the cross. We should not be surprised by Satan's rebellion. We should not be surprised by Judas's betrayal. It was prophesied by David. It was foreshadowed by Absalom and Ahithophel. And it's typical for Satan. 
and it was also part of God's plan. But that doesn't mean that Judas was a robot. John made this clear that he was a thief and a hypocrite long before he was a betrayer. He had been letting Satan into his life little by little until he fully opened the door and let him in. So back in John chapter 13, verse 19 through 22, Jesus says, I am telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me or receives the one who sent me. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in spirit, and he testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, the one of you will betray me. And the disciples looked at each other, uncertain of whom he spoke. Now, verse 21 says that Jesus is troubled in spirit. And the phrase means to, to remove one's calmness or to, to fill one with fear and dread. What is, what is making Jesus feel like this? <clears throat> what do you think is making Jesus feel like this? Obviously, a friend is about to betray him. Uh, this is minutes away. And, and that is the trigger that once it's pulled, cannot be undone. But I also think that what he says in verse 19 and 20 are very under important to understanding Jesus' fears here. I think it's hard for me to understand Jesus being afraid um, and, and being uncalm. But in, uh, in verse 19, Jesus explains why he is going to reveal the betrayer prophetically ahead of time. <clears throat> what's, what's the point of telling everybody ahead of time? Uh, they were all going to witness this firsthand when Judas approaches with the mob and kisses him within like 12 hours. Why does he need to miraculously reveal this? Exactly. So that you can know that I am he. And I... When John wrote this gospel with Jesus' miracles in it, so that he wrote it so that we can know that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that we can have life in his name. That, that, that is the foundational verse for the whole gospel. But John had to believe it first. And Jesus needed them to know that I am he. The 11 that remained needed to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was the sovereign creator of the world, the one who spoke the world into existence, the one who redeemed Israel from Egypt and led them to the promised land. They needed to know that Jesus knew ahead of time that this betrayal was going to happen. It was part of the plan. The 11 men who will be with Jesus the rest of the night are going to receive divine teaching like drinking out of a fire hose. Last minute instructions before Jesus' arrest. And they're not going to remember it all. It's not all going to make sense right away. And Jesus is going to have to send the Holy Spirit to them to help them to remember. This is going to be the best and the worst night of their life. They're going to receive special instructions from Jesus, prophecies, prayers, and promises. And then they're going to be shaken to the core by the betrayal of a friend. And then they're going to be shaken deeper by the crucifixion of their Lord. And then they're going to scatter. And when the 11 are watching their lives completely spin out of control in 12 hours' time, 
Jesus needs him to be able to look back at this betrayal and remember him saying, I knew this would happen. It is part of the plan. I'm still in control because I am he. Look at verse 20. And then Jesus tells them, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. So truly, truly, it means listen up. This is important. Who is Jesus sending out? He's gonna, he is going to send the Holy Spirit. Who's, who's the people that Jesus is going to send out? It's, it's going to be these 11 men. His followers. His followers. But specifically, these 11 men. Plus Matthias in Acts chapter 1, who's going to replace Judas. Plus Paul, the apostle that was untimely born. The apostles are going to be sent out with the gospel message of Christ. The gospel message that these men are going to preach to the world is the foundational message for everything that we believe. And Jesus is explaining the mission to them going forward after Judas leaves. Once the betrayal takes place, the burden of God's kingdom message is going to be on these men's shoulders. And this is what the, all the teaching all night long is for, to prep them for what is about to happen. And Jesus reduces the mission to 18 words. Whoever receives the one that I send receives me. Whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. So Jesus is troubled in his spirit. He is being betrayed by a friend. And I believe he's also worried about the others, the 11. This betrayal is going to be hard on them. And the crucifixion will be harder. And Jesus needs them to not lose faith. They needed to know and not forget that I am he. And they needed to know how important their role is moving forward. <clears throat> and after Jesus clear, clearly states that there is one that, betray, that will betray him, John says this. Verse 22. And the disciples look at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at the table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him and asked to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. You see, to the other 11, Judas was not evil in their eyes. He did not come across as an agent of Satan. He was one of the 12. He had spent three years with them. He went out on missions with them. He evangelized. He was the group's treasurer. He held an important spot in the, within the 12. And if you remember this in Matthew, chapter 10, verse 1 and 2, it says, And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal every disease and every affliction. And the names of the 12 apostles are these. And Matthew lists them, and at the end of the list and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Judas had healed people. Judas had cast demons out of people. It was unthinkable by the other 11 to think that he was in league with Satan. It wasn't on their radar. It could have been any one of them. Now, this dinner table that they're reclining at is most likely was not 
like what you see in the Da Vinci's Last Supper painting. Um, it was the, the important meals that the, Jew, the Jews ate at were, as I have read, were usually a very low table where they would sit on the floor and recline, usually with their head facing the table on the left elbow, and then they would eat with their right hand. So they're sitting on the floor, their legs radiating out from the table, and Peter is away from Jew, uh, Jesus far enough that he needs to ask John, who is next to Jesus, ask him to reveal who the betrayer is. And in verse 25, we read, So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, so he's reclining and he leans into Jesus, and he said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, it is he whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. I think it's worthy to note here that only John knew who the betrayer was at this point. Uh, they're all going to know by morning. But John bore the burden of knowing first and it doesn't say, but he may have been the only one that knew all night. Verse 27 says, Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. <clears throat> Jesus said to him, What you are doing, what you are going to do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought it was because Jews had the money bag, and Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. <clears throat> well, John knew that Judas was going to be the betrayer, I don't think that he knew it was happening right then. I, I doubt that he was able to process that or put it into a category. Uh, he states that no one at the table knew why Jesus told him what you do, what you're going to do, do quickly. And like Cody said last week, Satan does, doesn't just enter you on a whim. You have to make room for him to come in. And Judas has been doing that for a long time. And after taking that morsel from Jesus, Judas had made his decision. He was committed to betrayal. He was 100% against Jesus. And Jesus told him, what you are going to do, and I think I would paraphrase that as, what you have already committed to do in your heart, do it quickly. Why would Jesus tell Judas to betray him quickly? I can think of a couple of reasons. Things that are painful, you got to rip the Band-Aid off fast. You don't want to drag it out any longer than it has to. The betrayal may have been too painful for Jesus to bear, and I don't think that I don't think that it can be understated that Jesus loved Judas and he considered him a close friend. And it hurt. And Jesus also needed to speak openly to the eleven faithful. Some of the things that he would share with them the rest of the night were specifically for them, and Judas needed to go. There was a divine timetable that needed to be met. Teaching had to be done. An arrest had to be made. Multiple trials, a crucifixion, a death, a burial, and a resurrection. All before Sunday. So Judas got up and he willfully walked away from Jesus. And no one except for maybe John had any idea why he left. And John adds some thematic commentary that has ties us into the prologue all the way through. 
And when Judas left, it was night. He walked away from the light of the world out into the darkness of night. What a tragedy. Verse 31. <clears throat> and when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. If you remember a few weeks back in chapter 12, just after the triumphal entry, some of the Greeks came, Greek-speaking people came and approached Philip and Andrew, and they asked to see Jesus. <clears throat> in uh, chapter 12, verse 21, it says, So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and he asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. So the, the approach from these people, these Greek-speaking people, functioned as some sort of divine signal to Jesus, a, a pre-planned indicator from the Father that the crucifixion was very near. And when, when he heard that they were there, he told Philip and Andrew, the hour has come, come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now, in this morning's text, just a few days later, Judas has left the upper room, and Jesus indicates that that pending hour is over. Judas' departure is another divine indicator to Jesus, pre-planned from the Father, that glorification is now. It is at once. Judas was the mouse that tripped the trap. He, it, it set the machinery in motion that would bring the cross to Jesus. This is the height of Satan's rebellion, his grand effort at the throne of God. Like Absalom using Ahithophel to gain inside knowledge against the Davidic king, the prophesied betrayal of Judas has commenced. And the glorification process has started. Listen to all the glorification that's going on in this, uh, in this verse. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Jesus is glorified as the Son of Man. The Father is glorified in him. And Jesus will glorify, be glorified in the Father. It seems that the glory is flowing, flowing forward and backward and simultaneously together within the Godhead. This is one of those passages that makes my head hurt. <laughs> but it was prophesied to happen. Back in Isaiah, chapter 49, <clears throat> Isaiah said, And he said to me, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. This is one of the suffering servant passages that Isaiah is famous for. And in this passage, the servant's name is Israel, and God anticipates being glorified through this servant's suffering. And if you look at verse 6 in that same chapter, the tasks that are laid before God's servant Israel are the very tasks that Jesus is going to accomplish through the cross. It says, Is it too light a thing that you should be my servant? to raise up the tribes of Jacob, to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. Now this is a very gener generic summary, uh, but there's two things that are really happening here that are being prophesied are going to come through this suffering servant. 
the restoration of the faithful of Israel and the expansion uh, of the offering of salvation until it encompasses the whole earth. Every tongue, every tribe. In, in the greater context of Isaiah's later chapter, this is done by the suffering servant Israel, being despised and rejected of men, smitten by God and afflicted, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. Like a lamb to the slaughter, he bears the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. <clears throat> I find it interesting that that God calls him Israel. When, when Israel was the nation, was in Egyptian bondage, God told Pharaoh in Exodus chapter 4, verse 23, he said, let my son go that he may serve me. Israel is God's son. And if we know the story of the Exodus, about five seconds out of, out of the gate, they're complaining. About 10 seconds later after that, they make a molten image of a calf and worship it. And God's son as the nation, he was never pleased with them. They never lived up to the standards of what God's son ought to be. But the Israel that Isaiah saw coming it was something different. He would be a son in which God is well pleased. He would be a son that glorified the Father. And he would be a son that would suffer mightily to make it happen. Now the remaining 11 men that are sitting before Jesus are the beginning of a new community. They are going to pattern their lives after the new Israel. And as this new community, they're going to receive a new command. And that's going to have to be talked about next week. So thank you for your attention. And Cody will take over next week. You guys have a good day. Thank <laughs> you.